So welcome everybody to the uh, FIG Commission 7 Annual Meeting. This is session two. And um, uh, thank you all for joining. If I have a look at um, the attendees, they're starting to come in. Um, so we'll just give it a few minutes for that, for people to join us. As we switch over, we've got, we've had already one session, which all went very well as we test um, doing these, these events online, as opposed to face to face as we've often done before. So, um, oh good, we're starting to get people join us. And we've got four panelists today for four presenters who I'll introduce in a moment. Perhaps as we, um, as we get ready, you as attendees, uh, it's nice to know more about you also. So let's just start as people are coming in. In the chat, you'll see at the bottom, you've got chat and Q&A. So that's the way that you can communicate with us today. And please do, we'll, we'll uh, encourage you to ask questions. But to start with, perhaps you can just tell us the country you're from so we can get an idea of, of where we're going today. As we, as we talk to people in uh, African Europe, early morning, US and Canada, well, that's, that's after midnight probably. Um, as we get into Asia around midday and here in Melbourne, it's about 5 p.m. So in the chat, if you can just start by telling us the country you're from and we'll see, see where everyone's tuning in from. Walter from Germany, John Hohol from USA, Daniel from, from Australia, originally from Colombia. Thanks, Daniel. All right, we'll let a few of those come out, but I might just get things underway with a little video from, uh, from Daniel and John Hohol, actually. So let me just share the screen and play this video. Daniel Paez, the chair of the commission. FIG Commission 7, Cadastre and Land Management, is a group of volunteers of the International Federation of Surveyors dedicated to promote solutions and discuss ideas to better land tenure and land administration systems around the world. This year, unfortunately, we had to cancel our FIG in-person Commission 7 meeting, which was going to be held in Switzerland. Of course, we know this is not the same as our traditional Commission 7 event, which is full of friendship. But we hope this event will allow us to continue our network and hopefully with the new normality in 2021, we will be meeting in Melbourne, Australia. Commission 7 has done many interesting work is in this commission where concepts like fit for purpose or crowdsourcing for tenure security were developed. And today we're working in very interesting projects like um, GLTN framework for urban rural land linkage to try to integrate better development in both rural and urban areas. And with the United Nations Commission for Economic Development in Europe, and their working party for land administration in where we are developing new principles on a revised version of their principles for involving the private sector in uh, land administration services and infrastructure. Let me use the opportunity to thank those of you that pay a fee or made a donation to this annual meeting. All profits of the donation of the uh, FIG Commission 7 online event will be donated to the FIG Foundation. In this, let me now let you uh, hear from the president of the foundation what is the great work of this non-for-profit organization. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this year's Commission 7 annual meeting. My name is John Hohal, I'm president of the FIG Foundation. 
really big thank you for the generous donations by Commission 7 of the registration fee received for this meeting and given to the FIG Foundation. It is very much appreciated and very much needed. We will put it to good use. Thank you again. What is the FIG Foundation? The Foundation is an independent body under the International Federation of Surveyors, FIG. The Foundation was established for the purpose of raising funds to finance surveying education, education and development projects, and supporting young surveyors with the prime focus in developing countries and countries in transition in order to build a sustainable future. The Foundation is administered by the FIG office in Copenhagen and directed by a board of directors appointed by the FIG Council. Here are the current FIG Foundation board of directors. Two of the directors shown, Michael Berry and David Mitchell, are presenters in this meeting. Where did the donations go? To date, since its establishment in 2002, the FIG Foundation has donated a total of 165 grants to surveyors from 70 countries, which includes sponsoring 69 educational courses, meetings, and conferences. The foundation also aims to sponsor three to five young surveyors to the yearly FIG Working Week Congress, all from different continents. In total, 340,000 euros has been spent on grants in this period and distributed around the world. This shows the map showing the countries where the grantees have been that have received grants from the foundation as well as on the right side, it shows a high breakdown of the percentages in the different continents, continental regions. As an example, Africa has received 32%, Europe 32%, and so on. This shows a listing of the 70 countries that have grantees that have received donations. FIG has several key grant programs um, and we hold these uh, annually. They are the FIG Foundation Academic Research Grant, the FIG Foundation PhD Scholarship, the FIG Commission Publication Author Support Grant, the Aubrey Barker FIG Foundation Course Development Grant, and the FIG Foundation Grant for Young Surveyors Educational and Training Activities. More information on all these grants and other programs that we offer are available on the FIG Foundation website. The address is at the end of my presentation. We also uh, cooperate with other funded activities such as FIG Commission Annual Meetings, International Training Summer School, Young Surveyors Meetings, the Volunteer Community Surveyor Program, which is an initiative of the UN and the Young Surveyors Network. And of course, the GLTN, the Global Land Tool Network, the Social Tenure Domain Model, STDM, and the Trainer of Trainers. And this is also a program that involves the Young Surveyors Network very much. The FIG Foundation in this year's Commission 7 Annual Meeting, uh, I just decided to list um, some relationships. As an example, uh, you can see some of the people that are participating in this year's annual meeting and their current relationship with the foundation. As an example, Mike Berry is a presenter and a current FIG Foundation board director. Chetna Ben from BG is a presenter and a past FIG grant recipient. Paula Dykstra, a presenter and past FIG grant recipient. John Beer is a rapporteur and a past FIG grant recipient. David Mitchell, also a presenter and a current FIG Foundation director. And Daniel Paez, the presenter, past FIG grant recipient, and the current chair of uh, Commission 7. Also, Chrissy Poitso, uh, uh, honorary FIG president, past president of FIG, also a president, presenter, and a past FIG Foundation board director. And Ava Maria Unger, a presenter, and also a past FIG grant recipient. 
15 years ago, I was very honored uh, to be able to host the uh, Commission's 7th Annual Meeting, the 2005 Annual Meeting in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, this is kind of a, a way back photo uh, showing the attendees at, at that meeting. In the middle is Paul Vandermolen, who was chair of Commission 7. And next to him is uh, Stig Enemark, uh, who is also a past president of IG. And uh, so it's a nice uh, look back from 15 years ago. I wish you all a very successful annual meeting and thank you very much. Uh, for more information about the FIG Foundation, please visit our newly updated website, which is fig.net slash FIG Foundation. It has lots and lots of uh, very valuable information and I wish you all the best. Thank you. So thank you, um, Daniel and John. Uh, nice way to start. And thanks also to Daniel for, for making available this slot for for this focus on surveying education, professional education. So how is this gonna run this session? First of all, we've got four presenters and let me just quickly introduce uh, each of those. So we start with um, Chethna Ben, who is assistant lecturer at the University of South Pacific. Cheth is, um, is a very passionate um, uh, lecturer. She's passionate about knowledge creation and constructing good learning opportunities. And she's had quite a unique experience being able to, um, to teach to a very distributed uh, group of students across many islands. Um, so, so very, very much a good, a good ex example and good experiences for um, how we might deal with online, online learning in a different context. Uh, we've also, I'll, I'll also speak, I'm commissioned to chair David Mitchell uh, I, I'm also a lecturer at RMIT University, and um, we've also had, uh, you know, had like many others, had to pivot very quickly to um, to online learning this year. But what I'll be talking about is a questionnaire that we're doing with with one of our working groups, um, and I'll talk about that. We've also got Demo Todorovsky, who's chair of working group one in Commission Two, and Demo is at the University of Twenty, uh, ITC. He's the chair of the master's program or coordinator of the master's program there. And so he's gonna talk about their experiences with e-learning um, this year and, and before. And also we've got Kelly, Kelly um, Rixley, who is from Rix as well. And Kelly is um, the director of product development. So they deal with learning and development, continuing professional development and conferences. And so very, very much relevant to what we're doing here, not, not higher education, but certainly very similar themes. So she'll be able to bring that perspective um, as well. So we'll, we'll introduce those a bit more, a bit later. So how will the session run? We, we'd like to hear from you and the audience as well as from um, the presenters. And I'm just going back to the chat. I see we've got attendees from Cape Town, Rwanda, um, Australia, Rwanda, Ukraine, Netherlands, Colombia, USA, Germany, it's fantastic. So nice to have uh, a range there. Thank you all for, for making yourselves available in, the, in, your, in your various time zones. So what, what we'd like to hear from you as well as the chat is as the presenters present, please um, ask questions. You can do that using the Q&A down the bottom or you can do it through chat, you can make comments. So all of that helps to turn it into more of a discussion. Um, you can also raise your hand and we can, we can follow up with you with chat uh, about questions. Um, Chethna has very kindly agreed to be rapporteur. So thank you Chethna and she'll, um, she'll be keeping track of the chat and Q&A as, well as, as well as myself. Um, also we've set up some polls. So after each presenter, We'll, um, we'll just raise a question and you'll have various options to choose from in the poll and then we can share the results at the end. So I think we're hoping that there's various ways that you can feel as though you're part of the session. So let's, let's get underway. We will start with Chethna. Uh, maybe Chethna, you can quickly introduce yourself, uh, share your presentation and then, um, and then start. Thank you. Oh, 
and good afternoon from Fiji, a big pula vinaka. My name is Chetna and I'm based with the University of the South Pacific. Um, I feel uh, so privileged that I had this opportunity to speak about the selective lessons from Pacific um, Island nations and the different um, dynamics that the students had to go through, um, especially with this uh, very uh, surprising COVID-19 that hit us. And one of the things um, this has led the University of the South Pacific to quote upon, and this is something I, I love joking about with my students as well, is one of the many advantages of this lockdown created was students were now online for the right reasons. And um, well, we would like to believe that it is for the right reasons. So for my presentation, I will be giving a brief overview to um, I know that we have a lot of participants from different countries here on, on where USP is and how it is a regional university. Um, I will also be sharing my course experience during the COVID-19 lockdown and the social distancing measures that were in place, how we prepared the causes, some of the challenges and very interesting stories and opportunities. Um, when we usually tell people about where Fiji is or Tuvalu is, we have to give reference to the bigger countries, which is Australia and New Zealand. So Fiji is located um, in the center, if you can, you can see that. And then we are close to Vanuatu. And, and we have 12 member countries, which include Tonga, New Cook Islands, um, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu. And uh, um, if you can see on the um, right side, these are some of uh, the students that we had during the School of Land Management and Development. and um, with Pacific context, our internet connectivity has been quite low. And that is one of the things that um, we as regional universities always have to uh, face a challenge with because uh, if the internet connectivity is not good and we do move online, we are worried about how our students will get access. And uh, one of the main islands in the Pacific that has this issue includes Solomon Islands, Kiribati and, and Tuvalu. Um, so, this uh, first semester, when we were told that we are going on a lockdown, we were offering two units from my end, which was LM112 Principles and Problems of Land Tenure, and the second one was an industry internship. Um, we were quite fortunate in PG that this lockdown has now been removed and everything has gone back to normal. And um, it has been quite fortunate for us as Pacific Island countries to experience that we can go about doing the business as normal and not having to uh, go through an online session, especially with a course like land management. One of the uh, things that we noticed is because I had a hundred level course, um, our usual mode of offering, because it's a multimodal um, um, structure used within the university, we have a blended face-to-face -face in a print mode. For our print mode uh, LM112, we already had a resource book where regional students had access to the course materials, the content, the activities, the assignments, and some samples about how the exams would be taken. For LM318, it was an industry internship program. The mode was not as flexible. So we had a face-to-face -face mode only available in Lodala campus. And the reason for me to show you these two differences is because principles and problems of land tenure was a foundational course for students to observe the critical knowledge about the land terminologies, principles and practices, and the range of 10 more problems that are faced. But industry internship is more about um, students going into a workforce and learning experience through practical 200 hour uh, internship placement. What we learned for LM112 when we were told to go online, um, one of the uh, advantages I had was because my unit was already a print mode, it became quite simple, but I had to move all the face-to-face -face and blended mode students um, back to a print mode as well. So how do I give them access to the resources that we had? Because usually when the semester starts, there's a limited amount of editions and prints that are available. So to make that possible, I um, had to have interactive content. Um, I had to think about how do I make this course an interactive flipped learning experience where it's not just traditional reading, but the students are thinking and also participating. The other interesting thing that was introduced was fiber messages. Um, when the lockdown was in place, we had a lot of students move back into their own countries. So if they were coming in from Solomon Islands, 
they had to travel back. If they were coming in from Tuvalu, they had to travel back. And also people from, students from Fiji who were based in Suva had to travel back to their own islands, which include Kandavu or um, Ba, or whether it was in Vanualevu, whether it was the Vuni or Lao groups, they had to travel back to their own villages, uh, own highlands, own islands. So I understood that when people go back to their own islands and communities, one of the challenges that was already shared before they moved was they do not have a computer back into in their in their islands or communities. And the second challenge was the poor connectivity. And this was a, a common message throughout. So what I um, felt obligated to do was uh, give my mobile number and said, if there is any conversations that is happening, because we want to ensure that there's an interaction happening within the um, the class and no student is left out, we introduce the system of Viber messages to um, ensure that everyone's commenting. We also had the discussion forums uh, for a traditional classroom for LM112. It was usually tutorials where discussions would happen, but we had to move that using the course management system, which we use as Moodle and have our discussion forums activated. During the final exam, um, we used a problem-based scenario question so no longer did we have any final examination. We had to move to an assignment based 100% coursework uh, for LM112 because um, the exam centers were also closed. And um, the two types of uh, uh, theories that we were applying for LM112 was the cognitive and the behaviorist approach. So for LM112, we had 130 students, but because of this lockdown, many um, students who had to go back, uh, had to leave the studies, only 80 of these students were able to complete, but it is still a big number. We feel that um, this is also a contribution of uh, students encouraging one another. So we are quite proud of this number, although it's not you know, as, as significant, um, but, but it, is, it is quite good for a Pacific Island country. For LM318, um, it was quite more complex. Um, when the lockdown happened, these students were told to go back home. And um, the main purpose of the industry internship is to allow them to have a practical experience and network and share the experiences. So we had a, a, a proposal, a substitute proposal in place whereby um, during the lockdown, when it happened, students had already completed 150 hours on field. So the next 50 hours was the only remainder left. So what we had proposed was if they're not able to complete this 50 hours, we could ask them to uh, do a reflective writing, review paper of annual reports and performance of institutions, goals and achievements, and bring about a cognitive learning from their practical experience. Um, after the end of the semester, we had all five of the five students completed. This semester, we were quite uh, fortunate that um, we're back on campus, we can offer our units face to face because we are COVID free in Fiji. So that was a big achievement. Um, so you can see our students on the right taking an automatic level on the field, very happy to be back um, in class. So how did we plan um, during this lockdown? Um, what were some of the tools that we used? Um, we were moving towards facilitation. One of the, um, the the, uh, the advantages of moving online was now students realized why it was important to use their course management system. Prior to this, prior to the lockdown, face-to-face um, -face students were more inclined to hearing lectures and they would rarely log on to Moodles. But this time it moved them, it motivated them to use the course management system, which is Moodle. We encourage students to uh, set up a computer, uh, ensure that they have uh, some form of media as well, uh, a space for them to study, uh, a Wi-Fi and, and a stable speed. This was also the same as we started to work from home as well. And then we had a curriculum map. We looked over what we had done for our course initially and look at the, um, the mode of study and see how we can convert that face-to-face uh, -face and blended learning into a full online learning. It was quite easy because we had already our print materials. It was only a matter of um, placing it in. And then of course our lesson plan and assessment. The challenge we faced was on the feedback. Um, it was uh, a, quite a task uh, to reply to um, and, and get these 130 students engaged individually, especially when we didn't have all of their numbers. But we, um, in a while I'll be showing how USB has helped us with that as well. 
Then the third we uh, third task that we did was how do we ensure that group work is happening? How do we ensure that the learning uh, is taking place? How do we maintain this class size? So we did do a lot of Zoom calls. Um, we grouped the students together. We would ask them to select their group me group members and contact them. There, there have been really good experiences of how students themselves has initiated this group learning better than what me as an academic uh, could have done. And that really shows their interest and curiosity of um, what is happening. So I think um, like Biggs and Thang report has been sharing that it, it was based on the students' curiosity to learn that they were able to um, keep one another accountable. And the key to that was to ensure that we motivate the students to have a student-centered learning that I'm I'm here to facilitate, I will guide you, but I want you to know that um, if I give you a content and I give you the skills on how to read a content, you can do it and I'll be here guiding you and not me providing the how-tos. The fourth thing was the flexibility, the standards and protocols. Um, we were also discussing as a, as a school, um, at what scale are we going to be flexible with the students? Uh, what if they're not able to complete the exams? What if they are not able to complete their assignments? Um, what if they need an extension, an extra extension? How are we going to cope with that? So as a faculty, as a, as a university, um, it was decided that if any student, for the reason of this uh, lockdown or for this uh, social distancing, they're not able to complete the assignments, then um, we would allow them to withdraw and uh, they would be able to come back again um, the following semester. The second thing we did was allowing them extensions, um, but not a very large extension because we had to be mindful of our timeline on the semester and the works that we had to complete. And that's why also we had 80 students out of the 130 who were able to complete. We did um, uh, ensure that flexibility was there with their deadlines and submissions um, and the standards and protocols of uh, emailing their work um, while we do understand that students were finding it difficult to have access to computers, we asked them to uh, also handwrite it. And if they could either uh, use a Viber image, uh, photo copy that and send that through, um, we were happy with that uh, as well. And uh, the, the final exam was a substituted one. So we didn't have any final exam, but we were thinking about how to go about this. Um, so what we did as a substitute was we had a problem-based question for them. We would ask them to justify and apply a lot of the problem scenarios or hypothetical scenarios that uh, the cause had taught them and apply them to a scenario and propose solutions and justify why they had proposed those. So it was one way to ensuring that plagiarism doesn't happen. When students go onto the field um, um, online, we, we do risk uh, the high plagiarism on whether they're copying or whether they would be, um, you know, plagiarism high. So we, we uh, to avoid that, uh, we ensured that uh, no student was uh, plagiarizing. So everyone had to justify their uh, findings. So um, the, the challenges were thematically mapped. We had an impact of home environment. One of the things we found was when students are at home, then um, some of the household standards were not appropriate. They would not have a study desk. In, in the Pacific, we don't have a normal house where you have a, a designated area for students to sit down with their computers or their laptops and internet to do their work. They would either be using um, their farmland or their uh, bed or um, a, a normal living area, or even their kitchen sometimes, the kitchen and living room are together. So this planning and the setup of the homes um, did affect them in how they were completing. Um, and that's where the learning environment also comes into uh, play because the learning environment greatly affected uh, um, the gender. And that's why I've, I've written the gender biasness here. It was uh, um, quite typical that uh, women were um, told to be more in farms, uh, told to be more um, working with uh, their chores at home, and, and therefore it became quite difficult for them to complete their activities. Um, the second thing that we found as a challenge was the access to technology. This was uh, a continuous uh, um, requests sent by students that we are not able to find uh, computers, we're not able to find uh, a connectivity, we're not able to find uh, finances for our data caps. So um, we, we were trying to see how we can make this available as well. And this was more of a university um, um, help over here. Um, and, and I'll go over that in the next one. 
The third thing we found was being affected was the motivation to study. So there was an absence of regular monitoring um, uh, on the students and we never knew what's happening behind the scene. But um, uh, we were also hoping that there was some form of social responsibility from the students, from the families and from peers that they were with. Um, the fourth thing was procrastination. A lot of these students were procrastinating a lot. Um, we were seeing that the home environment and the impact of their lifestyle was impacting them and their priorities on their engagement and their time management. And the last thing um, as an academic limitation, what we felt was challenging was the communication. Although we were sending emails out, we were sending Viber messages out, um, it was hard to get hold of these students and, and partially because of the connectivity issue, the connect, uh, communication was quite low. <clears throat> the communication was also low. The flexibility was uh, also low um, because the uh, uh, we, we could not be very flexible with the students and our feedback observations also needed to be um, considered over here. So the communication, flexibility and, and feedback and observations were, were quite a, a challenge during this time. So what are some of the opportunities and stories from this? One is the USB support. We had a call center set up by uh, USB who had uh, uh, you know, been calling up students and ensuring that uh, they were all um, okay. And if they needed any assistance, we also had ICT tools um, and educational support from staff. Um, whereby USB had introduced this one tablet for students. So if any student did not have access to computers, they could use that tablet for a period of uh, um, one week and then has to return it back and then the other student can borrow it again. Um, we also had uh, staff training. So a lot of the perusal reading, a lot of the um, 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 training on how to assess students online, these were ongoing through online um, sessions as well. There were also prompt response from supporting staff. So these are student learning services. They were, these were the uh, Center for Flexible Learning. We had free Moodle website access. So we, uh, I know that USP had uh, communicated with a few of the internet providers and provided the university website, Moodle website as a, as a free access to anyone. Um, the lessons um, that we learned was Zoom was quite good. Moodle interaction, through interactive content work, uh, we used problem-based reports and self-assessment rubrics for the students because they could not engage with peers anymore. We had a self-assessment rubric. So every assignment that they would do, they would have a, a rubric that they had to self-assess just to see how far they're going, how well they're doing it. Um, handwritten activities were also encouraged. They could use photos to upload their assignments. So if they are not able to type on a computer, a photo, and then put it onto the Dropbox through their mobile, we were welcoming that as well. And then we used the screenomatic to record everything that we were doing as educators and placing that on Moodle as well. We had an interactive content, as I said, the perusal was good and recorded sessions. Um, the social part, I think this was really interesting. Students had that by themselves um, in their geographic location. So if, you, if they felt that they were in the same village, they would get into contact with two or three of their friends and they would meet at a place uh, ensuring that they were safe and ensuring that uh, no one was affected during this time. They would do the assignment and everyone would go back. So it was an initiative by the students um, that they had uh, taken on board. Um, so they were keeping in touch. There was assistance from families as well. We saw that when um, a lot of the parents or uncles that were there, they would also guide these students on how to go about it. So students overall found it quite easy, but at the same time, there were challenges. Some of the pedagogies that uh, resulted as part of it, uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication. There was a lot of inquiry-based learning happening. There was a lot of student engagement because they could use the cognitive experiences of what was happening in their communities. A lot of the content was about land tenure. And when they returned back to their villages, they could ask their elders, they could ask their family members. So we had to frame those questions as, uh, so that they could sit at their home environment and see the different challenges that they were experiencing during the time. So a very case-based questionnaire. And the last was the cognitive apprenticeship. Uh, so for online study, we were wondering how can we like model and coach and scaffold and articulate. So for a hundred levels course, we didn't want to go to the stage of exploration at all. So we were just modeling and coaching um, for us as an online. And uh, again, the feedback part of it was a little difficult because it was quite hard to get hold of the students. So um, that's, that's all for, from me.
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I just had to unmute my microphone there. So first of all, thanks, Jeff. That that was really interesting, and it um, it was a, a lot of similar experiences to us in in RMIT in Melbourne. And I just wanted to quickly make a, a comment here from Jennifer Whittall, if I can just bring up the chat. Um, I think maybe Jeff is frozen. But anyway, we'll see. So. Are you back? So let me just bring up the chat here. Why is that? Um, so Jenny said, we face many common challenges in South Africa and for that reason use non-synchronous teaching, no Zoom or equivalent, but students could access all materials uploaded to our teaching platform as this was zero rated by all major mobile providers. Most students do not have Wi-Fi, but access through their mobile phones. Family home situations, overcrowding, abject poverty, gendered household roles are a big challenge for many students. So, so similar experiences, Jethna. Yes, David, um, we, we also had the similar thing, the overcrowding issue. Um, sometimes when I used to have a Zoom call, there used to be a baby crying on the background or the student running to uh, do a chore. So we could see those things uh, um, affect. But overall, you know, if we had to measure that um, based on their performance, um, because we had reduced the um, uh, the time spent on the assignments and just to help them really think critically, uh, I think they did quite well. David, you're muted, David. Thanks, Timo. Thanks for the reminder. So uh, there's some questions coming up on um, Q&A. Thank you. So Walter, which resources, human and technical, did you have available for your call center and other facilities to support questions and other requests from students? So Chester, would you like to comment on that one? Um, these resources were provided by USP. So USP had a call center and um, the administrative staff used to take uh, the names of the students and uh, call them up uh, if they were facing issues. So th these were not only students calling, but the call center calling them back. So it, it was um, usually the mobile phones that they had registered or the mobile phone numbers that they had of their parents if they themselves do not have it. Terrific. Now, um... What we might do is do the first of our polls. And please, if there's any questions that can come in in the meantime, Jeff can answer those as well. But this, I'm going to launch the poll. Um, and the question is, when does online learning work best? And there's some options there, theory-based courses. You can choose, um, choose those. And as you do, I'll collect it. Um, and then I'll be able to share the results um, as we as we get to that. So in the meantime, if I can ask Kelly and Demo just if they have any questions, think about those for, for Chetha while we're doing this poll. And uh, a couple of quick things. First of all, the session's being recorded. I, I, um, so those of you who are interested um, in watching later will have that recording. Secondly, um, thanks to John Hohol, who's Firstly, um, been very supportive of, of these, um, this annual meeting and also uh, got up very early in the morning. I think it's 1.30 in the morning, he tells us to, to join us. And thirdly, uh, apologies to Kelly for mispronouncing your name. I took Ricks and I took Lickley and I put them together into Rickley. So uh, Kelly Lickley, apologies uh, for, for that. Still got, we've got um, 13 responses to the poll. Let's just give it just a moment longer and, and then we can I'll let that run for the moment. Um, Demo, Kelly, do you have any questions for Chetna? Not uh, for now, thanks. Uh, Chetna, yes. Um, just a quick question, what would you say the balance um, of your students 
um, were uh, uh, being excited to go back into the classroom for face-to-face -face sort of lecturing versus remaining at home and, and studying online. Was there a, a clear cut sort of balance in terms of the preference or are you seeing a blend in that too? We've seen an excitement for students to be back on campus. I think the campus life offers for them um, a lot more opportunities and, and they've missed uh, that as well. So uh, very excited to be back, but this semester because of our online learning experience on how we saw that student-centered learning became um, quite high through the use of online tools. This uh, uh, semester, although everyone is online, we've also blended that in that students have to uh, learn a certain subject before they come to lectures. So lectures become more interactive, but they were very excited. Brilliant, thank you. So let me just, uh, uh, I'll end the polling and now I can share the results. So I think you guys can see that. So we've got the biggest response for theory-based courses, the next biggest for part-time working students, uh, student-centered learning, student retention, small number, uh, no other. With these polls, we, we leave a uh, response other where we can check back with you on chat if you, if you feel like there's another obvious um, option. So with that, let me um, thank Chetna very much. Appreciate um, the presentation, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'll um, just stop sharing that results for the poll. And so next up is myself presenting. Chetna, I wonder if you would please monitor the chat and the Q&A. And, um, uh, and also with um, Demo and Kelly, if you can think also of some questions um, at the end of, of the presentation. So let me share my screen. Okay, so I hope, hope you can all see that. So this, um, this is the work of Working Group 2.3. So um, I'll, I'll talk a minute about that, but it's about a student questionnaire that looks at students learning and studying and approaches. So this was envisaged a couple of years ago. Um, it's taken a while to, to design it and get ethics approval, and it's come out just in the last couple of weeks. So, so timely actually to capture in this time of COVID, COVID restrictions, and in times of all the things that Jethan was talking about, um, students' perceptions and their, their experience. There we go. So this came about uh, really out of my experiences in the classroom. I was noticing just the different way that students were engaging, the different way that they were learning uh, and, and, and accessing learning information. And I just thought it was worth looking at a little bit further. I, I was seeing a lot of studies by academics about what teachers thought about what was the way forward with blended learning, with online learning. And I just wanted to hear more from the student's perspective. And at about the same time, in the middle of last year, there was this QS International Student Survey. So it's a survey of international students in Australia. And they said, amongst other things, 27% though were interested in online learning and 81% said they were interested in face-to-face. -face. So um, that, that's quite a difference. There's quite a strong story given that that time there was a push to become more online and certainly that scaled up again this year. So this is the work, this question is the work of um, a joint working group, Commission Two and the Young Surveyors Network, myself and Mohsen Kalantari from Australia, Chethna, also Franco Gurubuzic and Mudik Kapoor um, have been, we've all been working together on developing the questionnaire and sending it out. So it's essentially based on this questionnaire, um, which is from uh, the University of Edinburgh, really is where it originated, Professor Entwistle. Um, and it's, um, it's from a project called Enhancing Teaching and Learning Environments in Undergraduate Courses uh, by the UK Economic and Social Research Council. And this particular questionnaire has been widely used, well accepted, well recognised, and it gives us an opportunity to benchmark our responses for surveying students against many others globally, different, different professional areas, and really think about what they, uh, what the differences are and what it is about our students that are unique. So it covers 
a three different sections. What do you expect to get from the experience of higher education? We've included those questions in our questionnaire. Reasons for taking this particular course or unit, we haven't included those questions. Um, approaches to learning and studying, 36 questions, we've included those. But we also added some other ones to make it more about online learning and blended, so preferred learning mode and what other learning tools do you use regularly? So we've so far had 50 responses um, and these are the countries mostly from Australia, Canada, South Africa, Indonesia so far. Um, but that's great because it's only really been out there for a week or so. And what we hope to be able to do is tell a story across geographic regions, um, across countries, across gender, maybe looking at the differences, with different religions or, or across uh, where English or French or Spanish or whatever is your first language. Um, so early days, 50 is enough to tell a bit of a story today. Perhaps it's a bit like the US election. Um, it's not very reliable. It's about perhaps like the early votes or the early polling. We have to wait till the end to really hear the true story, but at least we can start the discussion and hear from and, and find out what people are thinking. I think we've got some pretty good students um, when I look at these results. But um, first of all, this is, this is what we asked them about the preferred, learn of, uh, preferred learning mode. So if we look here at the, the dark orange and dark blue, that's the strongly agree, fairly strongly agree, very strongly agree. So that's, that's both the first two very, very high numbers. Um, I've just got to move this little box here out of the way. Um, but we see that for, first of all, preferring to, to learn through face-to-face -face study, we've got over 80% who, who agreed with that. So it's quite a strong message, I think, first up and very consistent with the QS survey. Um, we've also got the next highest is I prefer blended learning. So really quite a good response there. People seem very comfortable with that, more than 60% agreeing with that. But then when we look at the online options, either deferred, not in real time or in real time. So this is the synchronous, asynchronous that, that Jenny was talking about and Chethna. Then it's quite a different story. So there's, there's a lot less agreement there. And it tells a story that there's many different preferences, many different um, ways that people, to engage and we need to really take account of all of those. The, the days of only face-to-face, -face, if we look at these results, we're not really getting to, to all the people that we could and meeting their preferences. If we think about some of the class activities, once again, the blue and orange are the uh, strongly agree. And I learn better if I'm doing an activity in class. Really, this is, um, this is just, uh, confirming what a lot of us academics, lecturers, teachers um, have thought is good is to have active learning in class. And so it's nice to hear that the students very much um, agree that they learn better that way. They like participating in discussions in the classroom, not so much my experience in, in my lectures. We get, um, we get a small cohort that participates a lot and the rest not so much, but, but good to, to know that they like that. Not so keen on participation in just online discussion boards, but reasonably comfortable with having discussions with other students online in online forums. If we look at how they um, access learning materials, this is just a little snapshot, a few choices. There's many others, of course, but uh, the ones that stand out here, once again, looking at the, the darker blue and orange, um, is that they like to go to the, as Chetna said, the course management system or the, the learning management system, Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas. And, and that's a good that they, they, uh, they like to do that. Um, the second thing is that if they miss a lecture, they find the video recording useful. It's certainly been our experiences um, in Melbourne. They also find some value in short videos to help familiarize themselves with the topics and complete assessment tasks. Um, but lesser responses with regard to using online games, some do, um, and also using MOOCs. We asked them what other learning 
online learning tools they regularly use. And the message here, I think, is that there's a lot of different ones, depending on the professional area you're in. There's some that are related particularly to physics, for example. Some are related particularly to maths, MATLAB. But I think that it's, um, it's important for us as academics to really be aware of where students are going informally to get to access resources. Um, and there's a lot of different avenues. Some will be better than others. And it's good, I guess, if we can be aware of that, but also perhaps use some of these when we're engaging the students. Just um, the last part is, is a little bit more difficult to really show results. There's 36 questions. It's, um, it's designed to have a significant statistical analysis where we assess against a scale of deep learning versus shallow learning. And we also look at the, the, the patterns of learning styles. Um, so so I, we, we, we haven't done that statistical analysis, that's something for later. But I just thought that I'd show here um, just a little snapshot of some of the responses. So in terms of the top five responses where they chose agree or agree somewhat, these were, these were emphasized starting at the bottom. I pay careful attention to any advice or feedback I'm given. Um, what we see here is that there's, there's no disagree and no disagree somewhat. So quite a strong uh, response, which is very encouraging. This is why I thought perhaps this is a particularly good group of students who've responded so far. In making sense of new ideas, I often relate them to practical or real life context, also very strong, which is great. I try to make sense of things by linking them to what I know already. Perfect, that's what we would, we would hope. Um, and small number of disagree really there, but not many. I try really hard to do just as well as I possibly can. Uh, whatever I'm working on, I generally push myself to make a good job of it. So um, it's interesting that with both those, there is some who disagree. So we have to be mindful that in any class, uh, students, that's their experience. And we need to, to work at learning approaches to, to best suit them as well. So approaches to learning and studying, diversity of responses. We, if we look then at the, the top five disagree, these are a little bit trickier to talk about because some are positively framed, some negatively framed. But um, if we look at 30, when I find myself, when I find something boring, I can usually force myself to keep focused. There's a real mixed response there. So even though these are, have got the highest level of disagreement, there's still almost 50%, 50-50 agreement. So they're all, all in this boat. So I think this is where it becomes a bit more interesting, where this is showing the diversity of classes and their approaches and their motivation levels and their ability to concentrate. And so we do have in classes of any size, quite a diverse cohort. So just, just to finish up, uh, we, we've decided to focus this session on these three questions and each of the presenters will talk to these to some degree. What does when does online learning learn best? So we had a poll about that. What activities need to be face-to-face? -face? I'm gonna talk about that a little bit in the next couple of slides. How do we blend using the best of online and face-to-face? -face? So uh, let me just move to the next slide. Once again, going back to this QS survey, one of the responses they had were reasons to, to consider online study. So, um, the, the, this is once again, Australian international students. So it's a particular cohort, but I think that the, the responses are quite relevant. It means that with online study, they get flexibility, they can study while working, it's convenient. There's a cost benefit. They can access materials online. They don't need to, to relocate or move. So all, all very relevant, I think. And then reasons not to consider online study they want access to university facilities, they want to meet other students, want to live overseas, need structure and scheduled, I'm not sure what that was, need structure and schedule, I think. Um, online study would be isolating, concerns about online teaching quality and value for money. So I, once again, all quite good 
uh, responses, I think. And I, I've heard that from some students this year who've been forced to come online saying they really couldn't cope because they missed the structure um, and the regular routine and the access to other students and university facilities. So that's all from me. Um, very happy to hear, hear questions. Jeth, have we had anything in the chat or Q&A? David, we don't have anything at the moment. We're still open for questions. Um, Let me do the second poll then while we're waiting. I'm going to allow panelists to vote here as well. So what activities need to be face to face? I've just got some options here. Lectures, field projects, computer software tutorials, compute, computations tutorials and other. So in other, we can check with you on chat. We have a comment from uh, Jennifer uh, Vittel. She's saying very useful as we will move into blended learning for the start of academic in March 2021. So um, I feel like there has been a raise in this blended learning um, in different universities as well. We're having a lot of talk at our university about what happens after COVID and having pivoted everything to online, what does next year look like? And there's certainly a desire to, to take uh, the benefits of, of uh, the online approach um, for a variety of reasons, for the, f because some students really, really appreciate it, um, but also because it's, there's certain efficiencies that can be had. So it's, it's a complicated discussion. I'm sure it's the same at many universities as we go into next year. Um, Walter has a comment. Um, he says, I think also the use of informal knowledge sources must be re-evaluated. Hmm. It could improve the effectiveness of the learning process. Yes, I agree, Walter. I think that that's part of the message that we're getting from, from the survey is that, that it is being used by students. And sometimes what they'll, the information they'll get will be not appropriate or not very good quality, but sometimes it'll be very good. So the more that we can engage with that and even recommend more appropriate ones, um, the better. Um, we have a, a question. Do you think student results will change or improve or decrease with blended learning as compared with 2019? Yeah, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? It's um, we, we're capturing people at the moment just as they're all pretty much all have experienced online learning completely. And so Will the story change going to next year as people shift to more face-to-face -face into various types of blended learning? Um, I, I, I suspect it will a little bit, but I think there's some value in us to probably um, to, to put the poll out there again sometime next year and see what the changes are. Let's see how the poll's going. So we've got 16, we've got 27. Um, attendees so that's terrific thank you all very much um, so we've got 16 people responded let's just end the polling i think it's um uh strongly share the results strongly uh towards field projects being the most important for face-to-face -face. lectures lectures um less so and computer software tutorials so i guess we we hear from that from you guys that we can do computer software tutorials online Sometimes they need to be face-to-face. -face. We can do lectures online. They can also be face-to-face, -face, so. All right, let me stop sharing that result. So let's, um, any questions, Kelly, Demo, Jethna? I think more of a comment than a, than a question as such, David. It's, uh, it's quite apparent for us that the, this, as, this social aspect of learning and, and being close to other students um, is becoming more and more apparent. And, and this kind of peer type learning um, that, that also goes on between them is, is becoming more and more apparent, which is quite 
difficult to replicate online, I think. So I think just from both of your presentations, that's, that's more an observation than it is a question at this stage. But yeah, very important. Yeah, Kelly, I totally agree. I think that for, for some people more than others, um, it, but some people that, that, that student interaction just to be able to connect with people, but also to learn from, from their peers is, is really important. Um, uh, my son's doing his final year of high school and they had to go to online. And he said, he said he doesn't mind the online stuff because he'll, he's, in, he's in a tutorial and everybody's still working on what he's already finished. And so he's, he can go off and multitask and come back. But at the same time, they've just gone back full time on campus to school and he also loves that. So uh, there's, there's sort of pros and cons, but absolutely. David, we have one more question. Um, what is the future exams as submitted assessment tools versus project-based learning, especially in the context of reduced ability for students to gather under traditional invocation conditions, assuming COVID isn't going anytime soon? Yeah, Simon, thank you for, for the question. It's um, it's an interesting one. We I'll talk about what we're doing at, at our university this this year. We've we've decided to go totally to online tests, no invigilated uh, in-person exams, and so that that was quite a big change. We also cut down the percentage. Often they were thirty percent or forty percent of assessments. These are more likely to be twenty or fifteen, and um, they took some careful management. We tended to open them up for a, a 24 hour period. And within that, you can do perhaps a two hour test through Canvas, through our online learning management system. But we, one of the issues really is plagiarism. And um, it, it really has to be managed carefully, particularly for subjects like maths or physics or um, those type of things where there's websites now where they can type up a question, get a response back quite quickly and put it into their, their test. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It certainly has its limitations. And it'll be interesting to see whether we, how much we revert back to invigilated exams next year. Um, let's move on to the next presenter. And so Demo um, Todorovsky, it, it, uh, Demo, you're going to talk about the experiences with the University of Twenty, but there's also a um, a review that you did, which which you don't quite have published yet. But I think that that's also informed your work, hasn't it? So I'd like to introduce Demo, if you'd like to share your um, your presentation, and also quickly introduce yourself. Very good morning, Europe, America, and good afternoon, Australia, Asia, and Oceania. My name is Dima Todorovsky. I originally come from uh, Macedonia, but I live and work last nine years in the Netherlands at uh, University of Twente Faculty ITC. My roles are, I'm a specialization coordinator and mentor of geoinformation management and land administration specialization. And I'm also education portfolio holder of the department where I work. And I'm really happy today to be part of session two of commission, FIG commission seven annual meeting, which is together with commission two. And I will present our lessons from experience regard uh, response to COVID of my faculty and specifically my department. So just sit, relax, and you will hear a story from the Netherlands and agenda for today will be as uh, follows. Uh, I will present some background information of ITC and uh, his uh, long, its long record of using an uh, e-learning tools and uh, approaches, then uh, how the first wave of COVID uh, influenced our way of education, then what is the current status of our e-learning, and then I will answer the three questions that were set uh, at the beginning before we start these presentations, but that was part of organization. So I will try to answer the questions as David did in his uh, last presentation. 
So background of ITC and e-learning uh, tools, approaches and methods, just uh, some examples from around the 20s, uh, 2000s. Blackboard, Blackboard was used as a virtual uh, learning uh, environment. Then in uh, 2008, ITC was a host of the first e-learning in surveying and geoinformation science and land administration workshop, and that was part of FIG International Workshops. ITC and its staffs are in, involved in many education development projects which are focusing on e-learning. One example is uh, teaching essentials for responsible land administration, which was project uh, from uh, UN Habitat as a GLTN par, uh, project. Then currently I can say that we are using Canvas as our uh, virtual learning environment. And uh, from uh, September 2019, we had also international uh, internal workshop on our e-learning uh, tools and approaches that we use in our department with making inventory, but also to uh, define the future of e-learning possibilities or our strategy for the future. And that was September 2019. And uh, unfortunately, at the end of the year, the COVID started to uh, develop all around the world and it uh, had a big hit in Europe in our quartile three or somewhere end of February or middle of uh, March. And uh, in this uh, slide, I will share some experiences of uh, what and how the first wave uh, reaction to our and effects of on our education was. I must say that uh, we adopted to full online uh, education in less than one week because uh, we have very good support from uh, personnel, but also technology. So that was uh, very much appreciated. And uh, we continue as uh, normal education in one week, but everything was fully online because our country was under big lockdown. Here we used to call it intelligent lockdown, but uh, education facilities were closed, uh, schools and uh, universities were, were closed. I think this was uh, very fast and easy because uh, ITC staff has a lot of uh, experience with different online tools and platforms. For education, we were using uh, mainly Canvas and MS Teams, but uh, for other things, uh, students were, for example, communicating via WhatsApp and uh, Viber and other mobile applications, but also they use Skype. So all possible communication tools were used. And at some moment, there were even too many. Uh, regarding education, uh, we had the guidelines uh, to move fully online and the recommendation was it's uh, recommended that some, if possible, lessons should be recorded so students can follow the lessons and then Q&A session after the lesson could be uh, in online, uh, let's say live meeting via Canvas, big blue button or MS, MS uh, Teams. If uh, the lessons were not pre-recorded, then other records were recorded in a Canvas, but also with acknowledgements to try to activate students with active learning. For example, after 15 minutes or half an hour lecture, ask if there are any questions or ask the students to do some recap of what was taught in the previous five or 10 slides or, or 10, 15 to half an hour uh, lesson. But uh, because this was very new for all of us, we felt that uh, students need more meetings with their mentors. And because I'm one of the mentors of Mao specialization, uh, we meet with students every week. And uh, it was like, sometimes it was group meeting, sometimes it was a personal meeting with uh, individual students. But after two meetings, uh, for example, in our specialization, I suggested that we have a mentor coffee meeting with students every Friday. And that was very much appreciated and students, because they were very much uh, alone in their rooms in the ITC uh, hotel, 
they felt that this is a very good way to socialize. What were the challenges in the quartile three or in the first uh, hit of the wave of COVID? Uh, some of the practicals could not be done and we had some challenges uh, for uh, practicals to do them online because uh, with uh, all these technologies we were still some colleagues were still learning how to use these uh, platforms like uh, canvas and ms teams but then uh, so practicals were the biggest uh, challenge or uh, lab uh, uh, experiments but also field work uh, field work measurements so they were postponed for some time later but also examination. We had a, a case where there was uh, there were some cases where uh, students tried to uh, avoid the system, and then there was a situation with uh, a privacy of the data. So we did the exam of the quartile three online, but then we got strong recommendation to do the examination uh, face to face. Again, it was online on their computers. It was uh, with uh, programs that were previously programmed in Canvas. But uh, those were the challenges that uh, staff and students faced in the first wave or quartile three in, in the last school year. The benefits that students uh, mentioned from this first uh, experience was that all the sessions were video recorded and they have a freedom of that planning time and also staff was saying that uh, sometimes they have uh, too many meetings and but uh, coming from one meeting to another was just a switch uh, to the screen on your computer then uh, current situation or I will share here with you what happened with uh, quartile two and beginning of the new school year is that uh, we uh, employed even more people as e-learning uh, specialists and secretaries and they were very big support to our education activities. We extended the virtual education platform from Canvas, MS Teams, but also Zoom for bigger lectures in, in big groups and uh, in quartile four everything went smooth uh, the only thing that changed was the exam that was online in quartile three at the end of quartile four was mandatory to be face to face or in big uh, classrooms taking care of the social distancing and at the end of quartile four and during the summer po uh, holiday, there was a staff survey to see which online learning uh, activities, approaches or methods were useful and what can be improved. But unfortunately, this report is not uh, published at this moment. It will come out any, any moment. And mainly it will cover the things, uh, which uh, tools were you using? What did you find good? What did you find uh, challenging? Uh, also students uh, did some uh, activities and they activated via their student association board. And then they had a meeting and uh, reported to us that uh, mainly the student motivation was varying uh, in this uh, period. So. At the beginning, everybody was uh, happy to test and see what uh, online possibilities are and how they can be champions in using this. But then uh, because it was a longer period, they start uh, losing motivation. And uh, there were also comments uh, from some students that sometimes there were even too many platforms which was confusing the students and they were not uh, champions, or not all of them were champions. Other thing was, uh, as I said, uh, student motivation was going up and down. And uh, some of the students complained that uh, exams were tough, but they were similar like previous years. And maybe those were the students that failed usually they are complaining. 
So this was a period where we were uh, having a lot of meetings, how to make a strategy for next step. Summer was good for Europe and August, uh, they opened all holiday destinations and uh, we were relaxing a bit from COVID. And then slowly the education went uh, to be more uh, to face to face, but depending on the capa capacities as at university. So at our university, the new school year started with 40% of education capacity. So staff could go looking at the time uh, two days per week in office and students were going two days a week in classrooms, but all the classrooms were first checked for social distancing, whether there is enough space for all the students. Uh, because we have only international students, from last year we have some students from Europe and from the Netherlands, it was interesting just two weeks before the start of the school year, this percentage was opposite, so only 35 uh, students confirm that they are coming uh, face to be present at the beginning of the school year here. But luckily at 1st of September, we had around 65% of students that came in Enschede and they were, they started the school year with the uh, first 10 days uh, online, but then continue with some activities uh, in face to face. And online students, uh, we're following the education with 35% and they're supposed to come at the beginning of second quarter. During this period, this is motto of all the universities in the Netherlands. We will uh, work on campus if we can, but online because we can. And with this motto, we started the school year, but since uh, middle of September until now, the numbers are jumping high of COVID cases uh, in all Western European countries. And now we are under special lockdown. So it's not full, not intelligent, it's partial. And uh, currently our new motto is just the last part of the first motto. So online because we can, and unless you need, uh, it's strongly recommended not to, to do your uh, act education activities online. I will con uh, try to address the questions that were given uh, from the organizer of this uh, of this session. And for the first session, uh, when does on online learning work best? Uh, when you're offering distance education, and that's a part of ITC, and we were already uh, aware of that, but we were also, let's say, skilled, and uh, we had some experience with that. But also uh, when you record uh, lectures and specifically micro lectures are very powerful tools. Uh, lectures of 15 minutes with very uh, sharp uh, structure and sharp message. And when you have these recorded lectures, then students or staff can look at them anytime they have time or they can repeat what they saw or what was recorded. Therefore the students, uh, it is good if they prefer to be at home or another preferred location, and then they have a freedom in their planning of their personal time. And as I said, they can repeat it more time. And I even see now when I'm doing supervision with the students for the master thesis, they want to record the sessions because they can go back to that and they don't have to focus on taking notes. So everything is uh, in digital form. And uh, it is also very useful in cases where the situation of COVID or some pandemic comes and it's needed. About activities that needs to be face-to-face, -face, I can say that uh, for supervised practicals or for fieldwork measurements, because our profession is also on fieldwork, for, but also for exams. What I noticed is that uh, students appreciated these uh, mentor meetings in a group or in person. So, and I, we, we share experience with other mentors and our colleagues uh, twice, twice per month about these activities because it's still a hot topic and we are adopting and trying to improve. 
Periodical meetings are, I think, also useful for students and they appreciate them a lot. And it's different when you're in class and you can just raise a hand and ask a question, then type your question and then wait if uh, the moderator saw the question or not, or you answer it later or etc. And about the question, how do we blend using the best of online and face-to-face -face education? Uh, opinions uh, among our, my colleagues are, uh, are, are, let's say, separated. Some colleagues uh, faced uh, challenges, and that's mainly when uh, we were promoting uh, this activating students, for example. And if you have uh, sessions uh, with questions every 15 minutes and 30 or 30 minutes, then you're more focused on students in the class and then some students behind the camera are typing their questions, but uh, you're not following it in parallel. So some colleagues had challenges with this and other colleagues uh, uh, get very well with that. So I can say as uh, in the previous pool was uh, done for theoretical classes, or I can say the classical lectures, where you teach for half an hour, give a question and answer session is very useful, but also try to find a way to activate students. So, or say that uh, this group will make a recap of the first part, another group will make a recap of the second part and the third part. So try to find a way to activate students, both in classrooms and uh, behind the cameras and based on this experience ITC uh, made the decision that we will uh, purchase uh, high quality video cameras and uh, audio systems that will try to uh, overcome these challenges that students behind the camera had. So for example the, the most simple example is if a student from the back of the classroom asked a question then if you're recording on your laptop, which is in front uh, of the, uh, the front of the classroom, students which are behind cameras cannot hear the question. So either you repeat the question and then answer it, or with this uh, high quality audio system and video cameras, which are motion, uh, sound sensitive or motion sensitive, we hope that uh, this will be avoided. And definitely for the practicals, I think uh, blended learning can be a case, but uh, there should be some face-to-face -face, uh, activities. So that was all that I wanted to share with you. And I thank you very much for your attention. And if there are some questions, I will be happy to answer the questions as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Demo. Terrific. So let's uh, just have a look at the Q and A's. No question there. Please um, put up some questions for for Demo. I think we're we're hearing a very similar story, aren't we? Um, certainly, uh, Demo's experience also is very similar to to ours at RMIT. We um, we have even the same systems, Canvas and MS Teams, and and uh, and also students are accessing WhatsApp and all sorts of other things. There's a, a question in Q&A from Kavir. Any more suggestions on how to activate student engagement? Yes, uh, as a part of uh, all uh, teaching staff in ITC, we have uh, UTQ or University Teaching Qualification Improvement. And uh, all the colleagues, uh, when they start to work at ITC are passing these uh, qualification uh, uh, trainings. Uh, one way was, as I mentioned, to make uh, breaks after 15 minutes or half an hour and first ask if there are any questions. And in ITC, after the first quartile, students know that they can ask questions anytime they have something on their mind. They don't have to wait at the end of the class. And the second way to activate student is, as I mentioned, to make them in charge of the lesson to recap what was done in the five slides before. So when I did it for the first time, 
the first student was not so uh, confident in that, but then other students start paying more attention to the lecture and the, then the second and the third recap was more, they were eager to make the recap because they were following more together with you what you're, you're teaching. So you should find a way to engage them. And another uh, methodology is uh, flip classroom. For example, where there are a lot of uh, theoretical uh, lessons, for example, just definitions and theory, it's very boring for students to listen what is on the slides. Sometimes you talk a little bit more, you have five bullet points, but mainly you're telling what is on the slide. And then for these classes, it's very good to make a flip classroom. So you divide the lecture, or if it's based on scientific paper, you divide five chapters of the paper to five groups in the classroom. And then they talk about it, discuss, and then they prepare three slides about their chapter or their part of the lecture. And then they present it in front of the class. So they are learning from each other and you are just moderator if you need uh, something else. We are also trying to put uh, other practicals like uh, practical activities and some of them are more active in bigger groups like uh, we have a, a court of justice and then we have a, like a stage what are the actors in uh, one process of buying or selling a property but we also have other activities some of the colleagues are using gaming philosophy to activate students in this practical. So there are more things. And uh, if you just Google, I think you will even find more than those, those three, four that I mentioned. Thank you, Jima. Let me, I'm just mindful of um, moving on and, and um, leaving enough time for Kelly, but there's, uh, there's another quiz, another poll that we can launch. Um, so while it's running, Dima, there's just one question. Uh, Goran from Macedonia says, hello from Macedonia. I have one question, how to do surveying practice in this time? I think you answered that a little bit, but do you want to add anything? Yes, I just want to say in Macedonia, zdravo Goran fala za prošanjeto, which means hello Goran, thank you for the question. <laughs> yes, uh, surveying practice uh, was postponed, but uh, we didn't get, uh, let's say, far away practicals from our universities in, in our case. So we just uh, went outside in our parking and next to our university, there is uh, one uh, park. So we did uh, these surveying practices in the neighborhood with small groups, but with more supervisors. So here the question of staff is coming uh, in place. So. In the past, we had one or two staff and group of uh, 20 students that were following the, the, the colleagues and they were using uh, their GPS or other uh, instruments for measurements. But now, because uh, of this situation of social distancing, it's it must be in this uh, condition. So that's why we need more supervisors to do the practicals in field. Great, thanks. Thanks, Demo. Um, so we've got, let me just, we've got 12 responses. I might just end the polling there and share, share the results. So we've got um, quite a strong Response, provide good online learning materials to support face-to-face -face activities. Uh, the next best record, as Demo said, live stream lectures and tutorials, also, uh, also useful, provide virtual simulations. Um, okay, let's just, uh, I'll stop sharing that so that we can move on. Um, Kelly, welcome, uh, thanks for your patience and also looking forward to your presentation. Um, if you'd like to to share your screen and, and just quickly introduce yourself again. Lovely. Thank you, David, and thank you for having me. Remember to think of questions for Kelly in Q&A and also in chat. Just introduce myself. Um, so my name's uh, Kelly Lickley. I'm here um, from RICS, uh, the, Char the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Um, I joined um, RICS back 
in February of this year, right before the COVID <laughs> um, scenario, um, into Dad World. And I specifically joined RICS um, as Director of Product Development and looking specifically at our um, professional development portfolio, which covers everything from professional learning, um, continued professional development, conferences, um, and learning and development and or training, and both online and classroom training. And the purpose of my role was to um, pretty much overhaul how we um, took our approach to product development um, at RICS and making it actually more digital first. So that, that was the purpose of the role and why I was brought into RICS um, and to bring about this kind of blended learning um, approach to our world. Um, little be known to us that actually then in March, that then we would all go into lockdown and COVID would enter our world and that actually we would need to execute and pivot towards digital far faster than anyone had anticipated. And to just give you um, a little bit of a flavour of the size and scale um, of what we did, um, in a period of probably about six to eight weeks, we transformed 511 face-to-face -face products into digital um, and delivered to more than 200,000 um, professionals globally um, in terms of our professional development and them accessing our content, whether that be continued professional development and training and or conferences. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a little bit of the size and scale of that and how we did it so fast and our approach to digital. I'm going to talk about the trends and transformational best practices in digital learning experience um, and assessment. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the tools that we have trialed and tested um, during this COVID period, such as virtual reality. I'm going to talk to you about the drawbacks and successes and everything that we've had in between <laughs> uh, through, this, um, through this presentation. So let's first talk about the key trends in innovative practices in, uh, and if I just blend this up as, as learning and development, you'll know I mean a multitude of products in there. So it's just easier for me to, to put it under one roof if you like. So the first, thing, the first thing, whether it's face to face and or digital learning, but more purposely through digital learning, we know that content is king. So, uh, for us, we, we trialed and tested different scenarios of lifting and shifting traditional face-to-face -face content and just putting it online, and then actually redeveloping and readapting some of our content and actually putting content is king at the heart of what we were doing. And we saw very differing results. So everything from, you know, on a conference that where we had 97% retention rate, uh, where we'd readapted the content, to where it was traditional face-to-face -face content and we just shipped it in a, in a digital means, i.e. via Zoom. And when we did that, the, we, we found that the, not only the retention rates drops, but the customer experience rates dropped too. So that was a really very interesting picture for us. So we, we actually come to the aspect of whether it's blended learning, digital learning, face-to-face -face learning, the quality of content will always remain the most important aspect in any aspect of what we do. The content needs to be engaging, conversational, action orientated, and it needs to address real life applications. So different learning styles, as we know, and the increase in the lifelong learning. So what, what we're actually saying is with our content, we need to take our learners on a journey and we need to make it as practical as possible. What we found with some scenarios that people were going away saying, oh, well, you know, it's really good. The speaker was very engaging. They were very knowledgeable. But. It's kind of like, what do, what do I do with this content now? I don't know what to do with it. So it's very interesting, very theoretical. It was fabulous, but I'm kind of left feeling a bit shortchanged and, and, and I now don't know what to do with this. How do I now action it in my day-to-day -day world as a chartered professional? Um, so we understood then that the content must flow and that there has to be a golden thread rule all the way through. So from one session to the other, it had to be, okay, what do I action here at the end of this session? And how do I implement this in my day-to-day, -day, whether it be digital and or face-to-face? -face? 
you know, so we got to this point about seeing, hearing, thinking, feeling, and then doing. So we started to blend all of that through all of our content. And that's where then we got to the, to the journey of like, yeah, now we know that content is king. It's not how we ship it. We can ship it in many engaging different ways, but if the content isn't quite right, then it's not gonna land. Um, we also knew that a variety of formats is key um, and boosts engagement for digital learning and or um, virtual events. So short, sharp, bite-sized, on-demand, something where I can be part of it live, but I can also access it later. So I can go back to it to really implement this, this doing aspect. So we, as a, as a product team, sat down and said, well, okay, if we was to build something like around baking a cake, how would we do that in a series of short bite-sized videos? So everything from what's, what's my ingredients and then how to blend them together. And it became very much a short, we called it 60 second bite size and Cranfield University in the UK also used this approach where it's a 60, 60 second bite size video that gives you a piece of information and then you watch the next video and the next video and you build up. So it's 60 second bite size is what we called it and a series of six videos. And people can dap in to where they're based on their own skill level. Um, and we found that that was a um, very, very interesting approach for us. A blended approach is also key, um, but the new trend does not only include self-paced and live events, but also on-demand content and video-based learning. So the, you know, the videoing of live lectures is becoming more and more important than ever, you know, to use the terminology that we use today. Um, we would say, you know, it would be videoing speakers, maybe popping some green screens behind them. So it's like sort of a bit of a live event, but we know it's not, it is actually pre-recorded. Um, but then learners can access it at any time in, in their learning journey. And we found that that was quite important. We also didn't move away from the fact of micro learning. It's a trend that's here to stay and our attention span and reduced and distractions has increased dramatically in the last 10 years. No matter how long a piece of content or an event is, it should also it should always include micro learning techniques. Um, and also open mobile learning. So just a little bit of a statistic for you globally. In Myanmar, 80, more than 83% of the population own more than one mobile phone at where they access everything via mobile, phone, mobile telephone. Less than 13% have a bank account. So that gives you the size and scale and how mobile accessing of content, I'm sticking with this kind of accessing of content as well as accessing of learning, shows you that actually, if you do all of your statistics, the majority of your learners or students will be accessing this content via a mobile phone anywhere in the world um, because it is how they access all of their content and it's how they engage with each other via Facebook, le online learning communities, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you can bring learning to life in a peer-to-peer -peer sense too. So we haven't gotten away from the fact that this is going to be incredibly important. So a lot of our learning, we are now adapting so that it can be accessed on a mobile telephone. So again, coming back to my point about short bite-sized chunks of learning that you can dip in and out of and have access at all times. So it, it comes to my, my perfect saying is like, right product, right market, right time, anywhere. And that, that is the concept of how we build learning and build products. Um, currently at, um, at Rick's and all of my previous roles. So prior to that, I was um, head of new product development at Pearson. So you, you'll all be familiar with, with Pearson too. And, and their digital transformation recently. So quite an interesting journey um, that we are all on. Um, you know, the next big key trend is a learning experience platform. And we are well on our journey at RICS. Um, we are envisaging that this will become live at RICS um, within the next year, um, possibly maybe pushing back to 18 months given the situation that we're in. But this learning experience platform which gives you a deep learn deep deep personalized learning 
an experience that allows content discovery and recommendations like a Netflix style, you know, or recommend your next piece of learning and your next piece of learning. Um, it's very web based frontage. So moving away from your traditional, very dry LMSs um, that we have known for probably the last 15 to 20 years in learning and moving very much towards a multimedia approach to accessing learning and development and content. So you would have all your recordings of your live videos, you would have digital flip books, you would have all of your artificial and data analytics sitting behind it. So it's you've learned this, this is what's next for you. So coming back to this deeply personalized learning experience and short, sharp, bite-sized pieces of content, you would have access to live lectures where you would click and you would click through in terms of this um, live scenario, just pretty much like what we are, we are experiencing today. It enables businesses to connect learning with on-the-job performance too. So we can start to access, coming back to my point about the impact that we're having in learning, right? So it needs to be, what can I do with this learning that I've had and what impact is it gonna have in my day-to-day? And this piece of technology will enable us to, to map and, and really understand that journey our learnings are, are on through, through their whole, whole sort of career process. Um, it's an ideal platform for creating competency roadmaps and preparing the next generation of our professionals coming in um, to the chart of surveying worlds. It also includes social and social profiles, which connects, it has a very much a a hybrid of Netflix and Facebook. That's the best way I can describe this type of platform that we are about to adopt. And it will be called My RICS or My RICS. So everything that's aligned to you as an individual in your learning journey, and whether you're a newly qualified professional or someone that's been in the industry for 20 years, it will be adapted to you and, and, your, and your particular learning. Um, and again, it can also be used internally and so on and so forth. So as I've spoken about is that we have taken this journey far faster than we ever anticipated. 511 products, I just wanna come back to that, that were traditionally delivered face-to-face -face are now digital. Um, some of the content has been adapted to a digital learning environment and some hasn't, and we have a long way to go with that. Where we're, what, what we also were very conscious of was this, this kind of face-to-face -face scenario and accessing this, this human feel and how could we replicate that in a digital environment. So with um, over a period of three months and 12 of our conferences, we trialed a virtual reality platform at where you were able to build your own individual avatar and you were able to sit in a conference environment with your colleagues um, and basically watch live sessions coming in via Zoom. It connected to the virtual reality platform. So it was virtually like you were live in a conference in essence, but you were sitting there with your avatar. We, in the conference area outside, we set up speed dating. So you were actually able to sit down at a table and have like a virtual reality coffee with your colleagues as you would have traditionally done. Um, you know, uh, again, we carefully sequenced the content. So it was engaging with this blended approach in terms of you were in a virtual reality environment. So i.e. it was live and it was face to face, but, but also the content had to be right and immersive for that environment. Um, I'm going to be honest, it was a test for us and we wanted to test our market. 60% uh, absolutely loved it, 40% absolutely hated it, and nowhere in between. <laughs> so that was kind of the picture that we were left with at the end. And uh, we're now about to trial it and adopt it in our um, learning and development portfolio. So what we're going to build is immersive rooms at where our students can walk around these rooms in terms of the avatars and maybe be picking out residential defects and things like that for charter surveying practices and as we start to test it in that portfolio we'll, we'll see what the results come out with from there so was it different from a conference style to actually a learning and development style and we're really testing this virtual reality or augmented reality space so it's an interesting time for us um, 
and and it was very good to see how our customers interacted with that or our charter surveyors. I was told when I joined the organization that it would take me two years to shift our customer demographic to any form of digital because they were so set in their ways in terms of the face-to-face environment, which was absolutely rubbish. As I said, everything digitally, we've had an average of a 93% um, you know, staying on the event. So we've had a 93% retention rate and our customer experience feedback has been over 87% all the way through all 511 products. So it was absolutely rubbish that people wouldn't like um, this kind of digital environment. Moving on, so what are we doing now? How do we want to get there? Um, And what are our critical factors? So I've spoken briefly about this kind of concept of my my RICs and everything being personalized to you, short bite-sized pieces of content. And then we're looking at virtual reality apps to capture real-time experiences for learners and trainers. Um, So in my previous role, we built a augmented reality um, product which helped resolve situations of modern day slavery and we built it in a virtual reality environment where we actually had people walking around the farm identifying red flags live in a virtual reality environment for um, resolving modern day slavery so it was an incredibly interesting product and now we're going to start to, to adopt this at, at, um, at RICS. And again, learning experience platforms can provide a space for user-generated content, images, videos, um, recorded sessions. You know, we're basically putting your learning journey at the heart with you at the forefront of the center and you are in control of your learning journey. And we will give you what you need in order to personalize your own learning journey, which suits your learning style and in the time that you have relevant to place on your, I I, I guess, um, your own learning journey. So we wanna spend 10 minutes a day, brilliant. We wanna spend five hours at a conference, great. We'll we'll give you what you need. It is, is, I guess, our approach. Um, Experience can be captured with 360 degree cameras um, by our community of professionals and can be shared in the knowledge hub. So now we're gonna be able to start to this kind of social aspect of, sharing content and you know hey Jim I know you were at this lecture last week I think you'll be interested in this piece of content so we're really starting to bring this social aspect to life digitally as much as you would do kind of in the face-to-face environment we also moved all of our digital assessments um, to a virtual environment we used Skype and we used we're most recently using Microsoft Teams and we put through um, 1,900 chartered professionals um, in the last six month period in a digital environment. Our key successes, um, that it would be traditionally a one hour professional interview with three chartered surveyors, so experienced professionals in industry. Um, We moved, as I said, over 1,900 candidates assessed. And we had a staff member join as a sort of invigilator, come support mechanism, support managing that that sort of that sort of process, online technology support, et cetera, et cetera. I think our key successes, we assess more candidates and qualified more new members than ever before. So um, shortage of professionals in our industry, this has been a critical factor and a key success for us. There also, we had volunteer members and they um, contributed on average two and a half days to support. We did all assessor training, engagement scores, candidates. Um, you know, there's a whole piece of learning that went in behind the scenes before we even went live. So th- this was quite significant. Um, and we also made some recent changes to the process to provide extra support to candidates who are not necessarily experienced in the required time frame, you know, for example, because a construction site was closed. So again, this virtual reality environment will help bring that to life in a bit more. So now you're starting to see the connection between learning and, and actually assessment too. 
uh, and how we can do that in this kind of virtual environment. Um, I think what was most interesting for me was that our assessor community became much more diverse than it had been ever before, given the fact that we had a wider reach via digital means. So therefore, you know, we had more, you know, female, we had more BAME. Um, and that was excellent in terms of, you know, having an assessor from a much more diverse background to give our learners a much better assessment experience. And we were able to do it on a, on a far faster global scale than we'd ever done before, rather than somebody coming to a hotel room in Heathrow for like two days to have a one hour assessment. It was absolutely crazy. Um, so, you know, this has been a key success for us. Through both, um, we've recently um, been named as a, an Engage Awards finalist, so a Customer Experience Engage Awards finalist for the best use of technology in customer engagement, which was the digitization of our conference portfolio with the use of virtual reality, and best use of innovation in customer engagement, transforming of our assessments to digital, and the size and scale and manner in which we, we did that. So we're waiting to hear the results. We weren't here until December. So very much on tenter hooks about that. Thank you. I'm probably going to pause now because I feel like I've, I've whistle stop tour through that journey, which, which actually in, you know, 10, 11, 12 slides doesn't really build the picture of the size and scale of, of what we've done at RICS in terms of this shift to digital and how it will impact a, a blended world. I think my key messages and my key points are um, contextualization of content is king. You really must get your content right. Um, secondly, whether that be face-to-face -face or digital. Secondly, short bite-sized chunks of content is the way forward. And the biggest amount of feedback that we had from all of our customers and learners was simplification of technology. So i.e. how you use technology and quality of content is what they're looking for. And that will help you with your your kind of blended learning journey. Thank you. That's all for me. And I'm going to open up for any questions that anyone may have. Thanks, Kelly. Fabulous. You've done a lot in a short time. Very impressive. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, Jethro, have we got um, any questions in the in Q and A or chat? While we're doing that, I'll just put up a poll that this is the uh, the last poll and launch that. So we've got we've got uh, seven minutes left, and I just wanted to be mindful of leaving time to uh, to thank everybody and to summarize and and also talk about the next session starting in six minutes actually. Um, but while that poll's running, um, it, do we have any questions? Demo, Jethna, for Kelly? Um, we have a comment um, from um, Rohan. It says, an often forgotten and key part of university experience, whether it's undergraduate or postgraduate, a long knowledge acquisition is building a professional network with students and staff. This ha often happens in an ad hoc way or through long days at night spent at survey campus. The relationships are used throughout a professional career. Great to see Kelly and um, RIC have been experimenting with VR options to support, but it was mentioned 40% hated it. Are there other examples or ideas for how to recreate this network building? Yeah, great question. And I think we are looking that, at that in two aspects. So I think I, I spoke a lot about the, the learning experience platform, which has this sort of live aspect of learning, personalized learning, but also it has a Facebook style aspect to it, where you can share content, engage and chat with, with all of your colleagues on this kind of learning hub, if you like. Um, and you will be able to talk to lecturers on there and you can have live Q&A sessions, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's one aspect of where we're looking at how can we adopt that um, and bringing this socialization of learning together. And, and the second aspect, when, when I spoke about 40% hated it, 
the 40% that actually hated it was the it was the simplification and the technology that was used. It wasn't particularly simple. And VR, we know, is just entering our world. We're not quite there with it yet. So the building of the avatar, the moving around the room via an avatar, they found that quite technologically challenging. And plus, a lot of them didn't have the software on their own computers, which gave them the very best technological experience. So I, 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 we dug a bit more deeper into, well, what was it that they hated? And it was actually the simplification and the use of technology versus the quality of content. Um, so we're now looking at how can we make that user journey, so not you know, not customer journey, not content, but the user journey around digital platforms, much more easy to navigate and to connect with colleagues in that virtual environment and lecturers. So, you know, two aspects in the way in which that we're looking at that from a digital aspect. Thanks, Kelly. Terrific. So, look, I think I need to start to wrap up now. Let me just, first of all, put up, if I might share um, my screen. This one. Um, th these to me are some of the key messages that came through today. There's strong social learning benefits from face to face. Online provides flexibility. Uh, recording, pre-recording is, is really useful. There's also challenges. ICT challenges for students running practical projects, running exams. And the things I actually, I think Rowan's comment is, is very valid. There's there's a, a real risk as we move to blended learning and blended learning absolutely is the future, I believe, but there's a risk that we do learn that that campus experience, for, for want of a better word, that's so rich in building of networks. And so um, we're all learning our way with that. So I think it's it comes down to the how of, we, of how we blend rather than whether we blend uh, to me. I think Kelly actually gave us a glimpse of of the future in many ways. So thank you, Kelly. Um, good tools are needed for online, variety of formats are needed. Kelly's multimedia learning experience platforms really um, give us give us some great ideas on where to, where to go. As she said, content is king, needs to be student driven. Um, good communication tools are needed. My experience has been really important using Teams, for example, to connect students and to connect with students. And we need to get active in our learning. Um, one minute left, let me quickly thank all our presenters. Thank you very much for your, for your time and presentations. Thank me, let me also thank Daniel and his team for, for organizing this great effort. Thank you for the FIG office, Claudia and Louise, fantastic. And thank you to, to all the attendees um, for, for taking the time to come and connect with us and share your questions and comments. So thanks all, Chester, I'll, um, I'll send you that PowerPoint and we can connect later as rapporteur. Thank you everyone and goodbye from me. Um, appreciate everything, all your participation. Thank so I'll, I'll, I'll end the session and I'll connect with uh, Kelly and Dima also later. David, do you, you want David. to share the polling as well? The polling. Poll? Oh yeah, the poll. I can do that, can't I? The last share the results. Uh, so we've got a slight preference for the video-based assessments uploaded to portal examinations produced via a secure link. Also reasonable response for large digital interview assessments. Um, I'm just checking, checking the chat was there. Any final comments? Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. We'll see you all in the next forum. And by the way, the next forum with this annual meeting starts now. And it is, if I just look at the name of it quickly, uh, it's the opening for Europe and the consultation on the GLTN Urban Rural Linkage Framework with the GLTN professional cluster. So please uh, head across to that if, if you're um, participating in that. Well, thank you to everybody. Good evening, good night, good morning. Um, and thank you again. Bye-bye.